In ancient Greece, there was one type of soldier that was considered superior to all others. These were infantrymen, called hoplites. We should imagine them about 5'7", 140 pounds. On their right arm, they would hold an eight to nine foot spear. They have a wood shield about 20 pounds, three feet in diameter, probably made of oak with a veneer of bronze. They would have two bronze greaves, sometimes even foot pads, foot protectors. Early hoplites would have shoulder protectors and maybe forearm. And then they would have a bronze breastplate that might weigh 20 or 30 pounds. That whole ensemble might weigh 60 to 70 pounds, which would be half the body weight of these soldiers. Drawn from the self-sufficient farmers that comprise the middling ranks of society, the hoplite soldier represented the military ideal of ancient Greece. Yet the type of conflicts they fought bear little resemblance to the long and protracted struggles we associate with war today. In early Greece, war was defined as battle. That is one single occasion that might occur one summer where a city-state would annex borderland. All the farmers would come into the assembly, they would vote to march out, they would go up to their fireplace and their home and bring down their hoplite armor, put it on, march out and challenge the other army to battle. Arranged in a tight shield and spear formation called a phalanx, the battle began with both sides facing each other very formally across the battlefield. An hour might pass as they attempted to out and unnerve their opponents. As the final moments drew nearer, a goat or sheep would be sacrificed to the gods for good fortune. The general would deliver a speech, called the harangue, to inspire courage in his troops. And the war cry would begin. So when that soldier got out on the battlefield, he was fortified by the speech of his general. He was fortified by the cadence or the sounds or the symphony of people screaming around him. He was fortified by the emblems and the devices on his shield that could be very scary. He would have this tall crest and he would also probably have a couple of strong drinks under his uh, breastplate and he would be willing to fight. Then at last, the battle would be joined. But it would be violent, it would be decisive, it would be over very quickly. And you would be surrounded in the phalanx by your father, your cousin, your nephew, your son. And so any attack to any of these people in your immediate vicinity would make you fight even more decisively and effectively. If you saw your grandfather's head be taken off or you saw your son's guts, you know, splattered all over you. After as little as half an hour, the battle would be all over. Perhaps, given the nature of hoplite armor, only 15% would be dead. They would exchange the dead quite formally at the spot where the enemy turned. They would put a trophy, perhaps a mound of dirt or an old tree they would pile weapons on, and then they would both depart back to their city-states and the winner would annex the land and the loser would give it up. It was a kind of warfare that would endure for centuries in campaigns far removed from the Greek mainland. We find hoplite armor all through Ionia. We find hoplite mercenaries carving their initials as graffiti on the, at the great temple at Abu Simbel in Egypt. We hear that they're all the way into the interior of Persia. We have letters now in southern Russia from Greek traders. Though less successful against opponents who refuse to abide by its strict rules of honor, the battles fought by these Greeks were to establish the rules of warfare for millennia to come. I think this is the beginning of what we call Western warfare. By that I mean, in the West, ancient and modern, we like to see the enemy face to face. We like to fight with him decisively, and we like to get it over and get home. We are not sympathetic to terrorism. We don't fight well in the jungle. We do not fight well with missiles. We don't fight well with ruse or treachery. 
Now we do all of that, but we always feel a little uncomfortable with it. And that has its roots in ancient Greece.